In the 90s, all camcorders shot on videotape. This did change eventually, and if you want to learn more about that, you can go watch my video on disc camcorders. But until about the early 2000s, every camcorder used videotape of one sort or another. Of course, that's not to say things hadn't come a long way. People weren't shooting on the original videotape anymore. VHS had been displaced in new camcorders by the 8mm tape formats. That's Video 8 and Hi8, which came in a cassette like this. Uh, it's about the same outline as VHS, but it's much thinner. It's higher quality, it's got better runtime, all around a better format, and people loved it. But despite being better than VHS, it was still an analog tape format, and those have intrinsic limitations. The picture quality isn't that great. When you copy it from tape to tape, the picture quality gets even worse, and it's inconvenient to edit on a computer or on a deck. So as the world digitized everything going into the 90s, videotape was sure to follow. And in 1994, they announced Mini-DV, which was again an improvement on 8mm tape in every conceivable way. Mini-DV tape was smaller and thinner than 8mm tape, it held about the same runtime initially, it had a higher quality picture, and you could copy it from tape to tape without degrading it. Not to mention the fact that you could copy it to your computer without degrading it in the process. Mini-DV got popular, I think, pretty quick, but the cameras it went into were not terribly revolutionary for the most part. Uh, for instance, this uh, Canon GL1 here is camcorder shaped. This was a pretty high-end model from the late 90s. Uh, it probably cost quite a bit when it came out, but it's also 3CCD, which has always been a very expensive option. It was intended for high-end amateurs or low-end professionals. But for the most part, it's camcorder shaped. You know, you put the tape in there, you put your hand here, you got your zoom controls there. It's not even interesting that it takes this tape because from the late 90s through the 2000s, you could buy tons of cameras that took this tape. Really cheap ones too. And they recorded a pretty good picture. As with really any format though, choosing to get into it the moment it hit the market carried a cost, both literally and figuratively. What was the first DV camera to hit the market? I'm not entirely sure because I'm not privy to all the professional publications. I'm not sure how to search them, but in the consumer market, it's pretty clear cut. 1995's Sony DCR VX1000. I don't have one of these for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is that they're pretty boring as devices, but the most of which is that they just won't depreciate. They hold a sort of totemic status in the skate videography world, where they offer a whole bunch of features that made them very effective back in the day for videotaping somebody as they grind an entire city block. Another reason I'm not making a video about the VX1000 is that while people will say it was the first consumer DV camcorder, I think that's kind of misleading. To me, consumer means you go into Best Buy, or I guess Circuit City in this case, and you say, I want to take video of my kid's soccer game, and the guy hands you this thing. Well, the VX1000 was closer in concept to one of these. It's what people call a prosumer camera. It's sort of in between an amateur camera and a professional camera, hence the name. Now, people will debate all day long about whether the word prosumer has any useful meaning, but you can usually assume the prosumer cameras are not the ones being sold to parents to record soccer matches. The VX1000 was definitely prosumer, so I don't think it counts as the first consumer DV camcorder. For that reason, I'm taking the other read that you'll find online, which is that the first consumer DV camcorder was the JVC GR DV1. This is that. First glance, it seems like a pretty well-made piece of equipment. If you're curious, this isn't silver paint, or it might be, but it's at least over metal panels. This whole thing feels like it's made out of aluminum, weighs about a pound, has pretty good fit and finish, nothing rattles or flexes, and you'd hope so, because when I implied earlier that early adopters get raked over the coals, what I meant is that this cost $3,000. In any era of history, $3,000 has been a chunk of change. I mean, the camera I'm shooting this on can do 6K, it's definitely not intended for consumers, and it only costs $2,000 MSRP. 3K is early adopter money. You just don't see this price tag except on things that are not quite ready for mass production, if you ask me. I figure in 1996, when this device came out, it wasn't quite ready to be ramped up to full-scale production. They were having a hard time making these. But JVC wanted to be the first company to have something DV on the shelves, in front of consumers, getting sold at Circuit City, just so they could get their name in the mouths of buyers. I think that early adopters are a critical part of marketing. See, you can't afford to make something at the normal retail prices, say $250 to $1,250 for a camcorder. So you put one out that's at an absurd price that you're actually losing money on. Then the early adopters who got to have the newest thing as soon as it's available, they rush in, they buy it, they immediately feel buyer's remorse. So they go out and they start finding everyone they can, friends, family, coworkers, and telling them about how cool this thing is and how, how fantastic the JVC DV camera is. Now, months later, when you're ready to sell something at $500 instead of $3,000, those coworkers and family go to the store and they ask for a JVC DV camera, like Bob has. 
That's all speculation, but the evidence fits if you ask me. At $3,000, this thing was only affordable in comparison to its direct competition. Both Sony and Panasonic were in the game at this point, Sony's VX1000 costing $4,200 MSRP, and Panasonic's I can't quite find a price for. Based on market speculation, it seems like it was between $3,500 and $4,000 as well. I did find one catalog, but it just says call for price. That's when you know it's affordable. So compared to both of those, this is $1,000 cheaper. Only three grand. Cheap. Of course, the Video 8 and Hi8 camcorders on the market at that time ranged from $400 to $1,200, and they were pretty good. Yeah, they weren't digital, but if you were taking videos of your kids, you weren't really going to miss that extra resolution. And if you were buying this thing, all you were really getting was extra resolution, but we'll talk more about that later. So I think this camera was probably a pretty hard sell compared to those established, inexpensive Hi8 camcorders. But on top of that, you might also have been comparing it to Sony's VX700. It was about $1,000 cheaper, only had one CCD. It was a much more appropriate camera for taking out to soccer matches. So if you were comparing them, why would you buy this one? Well, I think it's obvious. Its biggest feature is that it's small. As video formats shrank, video cameras shrank as well. I made the assertion in my disc camcorders video that decades ago manufacturers could see that someday we'd be shooting video on camcorders the size of a postage stamp, and they wanted to make that possible before the technology was there. These pesky tapes take up so much space, but Mini-DV was so much smaller than everything that came before it that you could finally make a camcorder that might actually fit in a pocket. I think that's pretty much the only reason anyone bought this, because it's little. Because I'm little. So about that. It is small, isn't it? Now, because it's small, it's bound to be cramped, and cramped doesn't need to mean hard to use. It's not hard to find the business end. That'd be the round one, so you can screw filters on it. There's a snapshot button on the front, much like pretty much every camcorder in this era. And around on the back, we've got two control dials, got a zoom slider, and a release for the tape door. And that's pretty much all the visible controls on the camcorder. So let's try putting this in record to turn it on, and nothing happens. Although, to be fair, it's because I've got no battery in it. Of course, that's because there are no working batteries for this camera, nor will there ever be any again. See, if you have a really popular camera, or maybe one that's still being used in a professional capacity, like the Canon XL1, you can still get batteries for it, maybe. But if you've got virtually any consumer camera, you can't. Oh, sure, you can search online, you'll find websites that'll sell you something, but it's a battery that's been sitting in a warehouse for 20 years, and the cells are completely dead, just like the ones that came with this camera. These will hold a charge for 30 seconds to a minute, and then crap out. And of course, somebody's going, we'll just crack the battery open and rebuild it. Sure, because working with lithium ion is so safe and not tedious at all. But I did give it a shot because they're very obviously just 18650s in there, but I wasn't successful. So instead, I built a battery simulacrum with wires hanging out of it and shove this in the camera and then wire it up to a bench power supply. And of course, that's miserable, but hey, at least I got the camera working. Then, a couple days later, I was flipping through the manual and learned that on the front here, this rubber that looks like it's just molded on here, it actually pulls up, and there's a bunch of jacks back there. Audio, mic, DC in. I've made the assertion many times before that most camcorders in history don't have direct DC power jacks, and instead you got to put a battery simulacrum in here. And now I've got a whole collection of cameras that have DC power jacks. I'm really starting to look like a horse's ass. So, using this DC cable, I can run the camera directly off the charger that came with it, and that's what I'll do. The charger, by the way, is a pretty nice one, uh, since the batteries for this camera are not very large. It's kind of, I think, the smallest I've ever seen for a camcorder, really. Uh, it'll let you charge two at once. That's a pretty nice feature, and not very common, even with other camcorders that use really small batteries. While we're talking about these batteries, let me flip one over, and I'll show you something that I just learned. On the bottom, there's a little switch. This little switch right here. And you can flip that switch. It's got a position with a little red dot, and it's got one without. But it doesn't seem to do anything. When I saw this, I thought, oh, maybe it keeps the battery from charging or discharging for some reason? I don't know why you'd want to do that. Well, later, when flipping through the manual, I learned that this is actually not a switch. This is a piece of plastic with a detent. There's no electrical contacts behind it. It's there only so you can remember which of your batteries is charged. If you've got a whole bunch of these things and you charge them before your kid's soccer game, and then while you're out there shooting, you keep swapping them in out of your fanny pack, if you remember to keep setting these to the off position every time you pull it out of the camera, then you'll know when you look in the bag which ones are charged and which ones aren't. It's a great solution if you remember to use it, and I think I've actually seen this on laptop batteries from the 90s as well, and I was just as baffled when I saw it there. Now I have an answer. So let's go ahead and juice up this camera. And of course, running it off the AC adapter sucks because it plugs in the front, right? So now it's hanging out there the whole time you're using it. 
nowhere to put your hand. Oh, that's great. I'm sure there were better places for that. So now let's turn it on and still nothing happens. I'll give you a hint, the lens cover is still closed. Modern camcorders might open their lens cover with a little solenoid, but in this era, you have to open it by hand. Now, the way this is often accomplished is there'll be a linkage coming off of this mode control dial that goes up here to the front. So when you rotate this, it opens the lens cover. But this one doesn't do that. There's a linkage somewhere. Where is it? Now it's open and it's on. Of course, I can't exactly show it to you easily because it doesn't have a flip out screen and I can't really just hold the viewfinder up there. Actually, that's it's working a lot better than I expected. So anyway, now that we are powered up, let's take a look at how it works. The basic controls are pretty straightforward. In record mode, you press the start stop record button to start and stop recording. You slide the zoom control up and down to zoom. That's it. Most people don't go looking for features beyond those, so for them, this camera was as easy to use as anything else. I would have some footage here showing what the video quality is like, but unfortunately, the record head in this thing is trashed after 25 years, so I wasn't able to get any useful footage off of it. Trust me though, if it were brand new and working perfectly, it would look like any other camcorder. Now for being the first camcorder that can practically fit in a pocket, as well as one of the first mini-DV models ever made, you can imagine this would be pretty basic, but actually it's on par with most mid-range camcorders of the time. In addition to the basic record mode, the camera also offers a five second mode, which takes a five second clip and then stops. I have no idea what that's for. There's also a timer record mode, which works just like it does on a still camera. You press the record button and then it waits 10 seconds before it starts recording. And as with most other cameras of this era, you can press the still button on the front and it will freeze the current image in a frame buffer and record like two or three seconds of it to tape. I don't know why camcorders did that, but they all did it. Below the mode dial is another one that gives you access to various settings. Focus, exposure, white balance, and a one labeled Pro that you would think is like a professional settings mode, gives you extra manual control, but it's actually short for production effect, which we'll get into later. Finally, on the top, there's an auto mode that just automates everything. The user interface for these controls is actually not bad, despite the camera being so compact. There are better designs. My video on the CCD TR500 from Sony, for instance, showcases some outstanding designs for manual controls on camcorders. This one is not a standout if that's what you're doing, but if you wanted manual control, you could have bought the VX1000. For what this is, it's not half bad. For instance, by setting the adjustment dial to focus, you can then hold the set button and use the zoom slider to adjust the focus smoothly in and out. You can do the same thing for exposure, and then for white balance, pressing set pulls up a menu, and then you can select a white balance preset using the zoom slider. This is how menus in general work on this camcorder. There is a menu button, in fact. It's on top and is hidden until you open the viewfinder. That's a pretty bad place for it, but I guess they just couldn't find anywhere else to put it that didn't compromise the aesthetics. The menu doesn't have a ton of stuff in it, but there are some things worth mention. There's an option called Wide, which was pretty common on DV camcorders. What this does is it puts the image in a 16-9 anamorphic mode, so it squeezes the image so it would look right when stretched to fit a widescreen display. Then it sets a flag in the recorded video that tells any compatible display to either stretch it to widescreen or squish it to letterbox. The DIS option is short for Digital Image Stabilization. This one's interesting because I don't know how it works. Modern camcorders frequently have optical image stabilization. The concept there is simple. No, it's really sophisticated, but basically, whenever the camera moves, the optical elements of the lens move in the opposite direction, and that causes them to counteract the motion, moving the image around as the camera moves. This is a really cool trick, but it depends on the existence of MEMS accelerometers, which I don't think existed in 1996. So how this would detect the motion, I don't know. In addition, digital image stabilization suggests that it's doing like a warp stabilizer effect, like the Zapruder film, where the actual captured image is larger than it actually saves on the tape, and it's moving it around to counteract the motion. Cool idea, but was that possible in 1996? Did they have processors that fast? It seems wild to me. There's one other interesting option in here under the system submenu, where you can set the scene mode. What that does is it changes the functionality of the five second control on the mode dial. The first option makes it shoot five second clips, like I said. The second one does the same thing, but it crossfades them together. I'll explain how that's possible later. The third one, anim, is for doing stop motion. Every time you press the start stop button, it records one eighth of a second and then stops. It's odd that that sort of feature would be in a camera with this kind of deluxe styling and price point, but I'd guess it was actually because this sort of thing was made possible by Mini DV, which had frame accurate editing control, and they wanted to put this in here as a demo. 
Going back to the control dial, the last setting, the pro mode, gives you access to all those cheesy 90s camcorder effects. That's where you find your sepia tone and your strobe mode. There's probably a mosaic in there that I just didn't find, but it also gives you access to fades, and those are interesting. Fade to black is a feature that's been in video cameras since the 70s. Now this adds fade to white, which is not that impressive, but it also adds a bunch of crossfades, where when you start recording, it can crossfade with the previous clip you recorded. Now, that seems impossible unless the camera has a multi-second video buffer, but it doesn't do that. Instead, every time you hit stop, it freezes the current frame in a frame buffer. Then when you hit record again, it starts recording that still frame and then crossfades into the new moving image. So when you watch the video back afterwards, every time it goes to a fade, you see it freeze and then fade into the new image. But that was a pretty cool effect in 1996, so I guess bonus. One bummer is that if you shut the camera off, it loses the frame buffer contents. So if you want to do a long series of cuts that all have these crossfade effects, you have to keep the camera on the entire time, which for reasons we'll discuss later was difficult. So there's a few other visual effects in there, but nothing impressive, just 90s camcorder shenanigans. Let's move on to more unique elements. The playback mode does exactly what it says on the tin, but where are the playback controls? Play, pause, etc. Where are they hiding? They're not under the viewfinder. They're under here. And no, this doesn't come off. You can't flip it up, you can't pop it out. It stays right there. And of course, while you can collapse the viewfinder if you're playing this hooked up to a TV, if you're doing it in the field, the viewfinder doesn't work that way. So you have to pull it open, turning the camera into this ridiculous Tetris block. There are many ways to solve this problem, ways that other manufacturers chose for almost every other camcorder ever made, but I guess JVC woke up this day and chose violence. This is one of those decisions that I feel had to have been made because they wanted to make the camera look like a flawless, magical rectangle, but it doesn't survive contact with any actual use case. As soon as you go to use this thing, it begins looking like a ridiculous pile of garbage. Now, if you did want to watch your video on a TV, that was possible, but as I've explained before, almost nobody ever bought a VCR that played something other than VHS tape, which meant if you were going to play Video 8, Hi8, or Mini DV, you were going to have to plug your camcorder into your TV to do it. This here is your AV jack. For about 15 years, this is what everything used for AV. It's a 3.5mm headphone plug that adapts out to three RCAs. Or if your camera sucks or you can't find the right one, two RCAs. This cable is ridiculous and tragic because Mini DV was supposed to bring higher quality video to the masses, and indeed, this camera almost certainly shoots fantastic video, but this is the only way you can get it out? Viewing DV over composite was throwing away a lot of picture quality, so what was the solution? Surely there was a solution, right? This is the camera's dock, and it's kind of extra. It's kind of a chunky boy. JVC's solution to not having made this camera large enough to contain all of its necessary components was to externalize them into this thing. That in itself is not that unusual. There's a lot of cameras that have docks, but this one is pretty chunky and using it is a lot more violent than you'd expect. You put the camcorder on the dock, but that's not enough to engage it because see, on the bottom there's this sliding cover and for some reason, JVC couldn't figure out a way to open this automatically. So instead, you put it on here and then you rack this lever like a rifle bolt. And when you want to remove it, you got to press this release that pops this massive internal spring. It's like operating an M1 Garand. Now, even with this thing docked to its militaristic receiver, you don't get that much up front. It's got larger versions of the same play controls that are on the camera, Natch. Then on the back here, you do have S-Video, so at least there's that. On the front, there's an edit jack, and you can plug this into a compatible remote pause port on a VCR. The idea here is when you hit play here, the VCR will start recording. When you hit pause here, it'll pause recording. That way you can assemble a series of clips onto a VHS tape. Now, the cool thing about this is if your VCR takes longer for it to start recording than this expects, you can actually calibrate it so that when you hit play, it'll wait 100 milliseconds or whatever for your VCR to actually get unpaused and start rolling before it starts playing over here. It's a pretty cool feature. Not sure if it was anything special here, but I'd never seen it before. Around on the back, we've got this thing called JLIP, which was like a proto firewire almost. It was a serial interface you could plug into your PC so you could do like sophisticated remote editing stuff from software. Uh, you could pull down like single still images over it, that kind of thing, but not nearly as good as firewire. Finally, around on the front, you've got the most useful feature on the whole dock, the infrared receiver. If you can believe this, this camcorder has no remote control functionality. I thought this here was an IR receiver for a remote, but the manual says it's a white balance sensor. It's weird that it's not milky white like every other one of those I've ever seen, but 
it is what it is. You can't control this camera remotely. That would be why it has a self timer function, a thing I've never seen on any other camcorders because almost every other camcorder I've seen has an infrared receiver. So instead of having to press the button and then run out and get ready for it to start recording, you just back up and press the record button on the remote. It's a wild feature to have left out. But anyway, once you've got this thing back home and docked, you can at least do a lot of stuff with the remote. Now, I don't have the remote, but at least I have the manual. In addition to letting you sit back at your couch in order to play your videos while this thing's plugged into your TV, it also gives you access to a bunch of editing functions. You've got your freeze frame, you've got your punch in, punch out, insert editing, that sort of thing, audio dubbing, I think. In addition, you can perform a few post-production effects. Nothing wild, it's pretty much just the silly 90s effects that are already in the camera, the sepia tone, the strobe, etc. It's just cool that you can do them in post rather than when you're recording the video. I like the idea that 20 years later, you might actually have the clean copy of your tape instead of the one that you inexplicably put a mosaic effect on. There's also the ability to digitally zoom in and pan around in post. And of course you lose quality doing that, but that actually is a pretty cool feature. So the dock and the remote certainly add a lot of capability to this camera. And you can also put this thing under your TV, cabled up to your TV permanently. And then when you get home from your soccer match or whatever, you just slam this thing down, sit back on your couch and use the remote to operate it just like a VCR except it has a fan. It's not the loudest fan in the world. I mean, maybe it was quieter when it was new, but I don't know that I've ever seen it outside of a huge AV receiver that my girlfriend got like last year. I've never seen anything I can think of that goes under a TV and has a fan in it because you're gonna hear the fan over the TV, I promise. So the idea of a fan here where you'll probably hear it over your TV is a wild decision, but it gets wilder for two reasons. The first is that there's no vents. Yeah, there's an intake, but there's no output vents anywhere, which means the only way this could work is for air to come in here and then get blown out through the holes in the RCAs, the cracks in the case, and the slot for the lever. What monster designs something like that? But the other wild thing is that this fan isn't for cooling off the dock. I've had this thing open. There's not much in there. There's a couple microcontrollers for handling like the buttons here and receiving the IR signals. Nothing that should require active cooling. No, this is for cooling the camera. Much like today's mirrorless cameras, this isn't actually engineered to dissipate heat effectively. So there's a warning in the manual saying, if you're going to use this thing long term for playback, don't lay it on that side, the side that JVC engineered to lay on the dock. So the dock is pulling air in here, blowing it under the plastic sled the camera's sitting on, trying to cool it off, and then exhausting the slightly warmed air through the cracks and crevices all around the case. Whoever did this needs to go under the jail. What is this thing? Did JVC hire a guy? The manual also says if you don't have the dock, you can use the upright stand that was included with the camera. And this is another sort of tacit acknowledgement of the design issues with this thing. I don't have this stand, but it's basically a little plastic cradle that just holds the camera like this, because otherwise, if you put it on a surface and say, use the self timer, it will fall over. So they included this little plastic stand with these things. I guess you're just supposed to take it everywhere in case you want to use the camera like that. And to lessen the sting, they also made it a wrap for the AV cables. I guess that's better. Why they couldn't just have a flip out foot down here is anyone's guess. Now at this point, a bunch of people are starting to get real uncomfortable because it's not here. It's missing. They thought it'd be on the camera. It's not on the camera. They thought it might be on the dock, but it's not on the dock. Where is it? Where's the firewire? TV camcorders have firewire, so you can plug them into another camcorder or a deck or a PC or an iMac and get the video off losslessly digitally. This doesn't have it. It doesn't have one. There's no firewire port. There's no secret. There's no adapter. There's no extra dock. It just doesn't have one. So at this time, there was no way to recover your video digitally once you'd shot it. I have no further comments. <laughs> There's just no firewire. Now with all those capabilities and the new technology, you could probably imagine this thing chewed through batteries at a hot clip, especially given how small they are. And that would seem to be true because JVC also produced this, the CUV777U Power Grip. For people who need gratuitous amounts of energy. It's the most ridiculous name possible. Much like the battery grips for modern SLR cameras, this adds the ability to use two batteries at once. You can open this here, put one guy in like that, put one guy in like that. Then you take this battery door, which just comes all the way off and sort of get it in there. And yeah, uh, there we go. Now, kind of a silly thing is while this will let you use two batteries, you also have to use two batteries in it because while the native voltage of this camera's batteries is 3.7 volts, this doesn't go into the battery compartment. It goes into the DC jack on the front and that expects six volts, which you can't get out of one cell. 
It's not really a problem, but it's kind of silly. Another thing this offers is a hand strap like every other camcorder on the market, and a lot of people are realizing how uncomfortable that was making them suddenly. This thing is a $3,000 stick of butter. It's not exactly iPhone slick, but if your hands were a little greasy, this could easily pop out of them and dash your last four paychecks to pieces on your patio tiles. Of course, they do have a wrist strap on here, but anybody who owned a Wii can tell you those are far from foolproof. Everything about the power grip looks and feels cheap. Everything on it is made for the minimum possible cost and you could break it in a moment's notice. I think that's because JVC didn't actually want to make this. I think these are features that they didn't really want to put in the camera because they wanted the camera to look beautiful and sleek and magical. And then at the last second, they discovered that it was unusable, that the batteries were too small and that without a hand grip, you could drop the thing. And they had to rush to patch these in at the last second. They probably had a huge fight over it and then rushed this thing out and rush to this thing out because they really should have put an S video port on the camera like every other camera on the market. But instead they had to put these features into extra components, components that weren't cheap. This thing is $90 for this awful piece of AliExpress plastic. This mirrors how smartphones are designed to look good, even though not a single one of them is actually going to be used without a case. They're designed to look beautiful in the packaging, beautiful in the marketing, and then you buy one, you immediately put it in the case so you can actually use it without destroying it. If you have any question about whether this thing was a last second decision that JVC's designers reluctantly agreed to do right before this thing hit market, let me show you how it attaches. As established, this plug goes into the DC jack on the front of the camera. However, the DC jack is covered by a rubber flap. And even if you open the rubber flap, there's nowhere you can put it where it won't interfere with the grip. When I first got this thing, I struggled to get it assembled. See, you gotta take these little metal hooks and put them into these little slots, and they don't really fit because those slots are intended for the dock, not for this thing. And then you go to swing this in, but the rubber flap won't go under this plastic ledge here. So I struggled with this. I tried pushing it, I tried folding this under, and I, I tried folding it up here and I was getting so mad and then I, I opened the box again and I found tucked behind a flap in the box the instructions and the instructions made me even angrier. The instructions say you're supposed to just rip the rubber cover out of the camera. Are you seeing this? Like, is this for real? I don't care what year it is. Is this a bit? A JVC product does this? But it works. You grab the rubber cover and you, oh, this feels so bad. Uh, oh, it feels like you're destroying it. And you are a little, I mean, it's, it's PVC. It's not like it's silicone or something. If you do this enough times, it's going to be destroyed. And now of course, you know, your AV jacks are exposed up here. No rubber cover for those. I mean, look at this. Your, your finger rests on the power connector. Uh, there's no longer a rubber grip here to put your fingers on. I mean, this thing, this doesn't work. This was designed to add necessary features to this camera and it doesn't work. It also looks terrible. But hey, you know, now you have the camera you paid for. Here's the finished camera that you should have been given in the first place. And if they'd integrated these features into the original camera, instead of balking, instead of very obviously seeing what they needed to do and refusing to do it out of pride or something, then this, this could have been good, but instead it's terrible. And I think that's the story of this camera. Fortunately, the rubber cover isn't ruined. You can put it back on. You just have to take these little PVC things and, and sort of push them in there and then they, they fold up and you, you gotta do it again. And you like get a, a tool, like a screwdriver or something and push it in there. It's just awful. It did work eventually. I got the thing back on, but the mouthfeel of the whole experience is, is just ghastly. This is what I call a jewelry product. Yes, it's a functioning camcorder, but all of its design is meant to make the user feel rich. The metal panels, the hidden controls, the impossibly compact everything is meant to make this feel less like a tool and more like a fashion statement. That's not a comment on women's buying habits specifically. I'm sure there was a big gendered push in the marketing for this thing, but regardless of gender roles, everyone buys jewelry products. Nerds will buy network switches and servers that they have no use for, and hyper-masculine dudes will buy very tall trucks that will never take off-road. These things look like tools, but they're actually signifiers of wealth. This thing was designed to look futuristic and perfect and expensive, and I think in the process of doing that, JVC cut out some features that it actually needed. So that was great for them because they didn't have to put these things in the marketing material. You just see this in the product shots. Then you buy it, and you immediately have to buy these. I don't know that that necessarily matters because I don't know that JVC cared whether this was usable or not. 
While it's pretty hackneyed at this late date to say that form should follow function, JVC could have made this a much better camera if they just put these things in it from the get-go. On the other hand, this form factor, which I call the cigarette pack, went on to become quite popular. For instance, a couple years later, in 1998, Sony was selling this guy here, the DCR PC10, which is, in a lot of ways, pretty much the same camera. And I think that this is where that design started. I don't believe anybody made anything like this for 8mm tape. I could be wrong, but I certainly haven't seen it. The zoom controls on the side instead of the back, the play controls are on the back instead of the side, and the AV controls are on the side instead of the front, pretty much like rotating the DV1 90 degrees, but also putting all these things in more sensible locations. It also has a hand strap and a flip out LCD, something that was already popular in the mid 90s, and I have to assume JVC just decided wasn't slick enough for this guy, but if they had added one, it would have made this a much better camera. There are a couple other interesting things about this camera, but that's material for another video. In fact, I already did a video uh, about the unobtainable battery for this thing. I don't know if that'll be out by the time this one comes out. This proves, however, that JVC nailed it on inventing a new form factor, which is a very hard thing to do. Camcorder companies put out weird stuff like this all the time, and most of it doesn't stick. Everybody just reverts back to your standard camcorder shape. But this time it did, and people started cloning what JVC had made. This is ground zero for a revolution in camcorder design that persisted well up into the all-digital era. The early action cameras prior to the GoPro and whatnot were these sort of pistol grip things with a flip-out LCD, which are basically modeled after this. So JVC did a great job with this design, but if they'd gone a little bit further and made this instead, they would have made a fantastic camera instead of just a beautiful one. So that's the end of this story. If you liked that, it'd be cool if you could subscribe. Let me know if you're into this sort of thing. I'll make more of it. If you really liked it, it'd be cool if you could subscribe to my Patreon. I need a lot of money to buy weird stuff like this on eBay, I have to admit. And everybody on Patreon has really been helping me with that. So if you could too, that'd be fantastic. All the people who've been helping me out so far on Patreon, thank you so much. Here are some of those people. Really grateful to all of you and everybody else. Thanks for watching.